Shmot means the book of names. So when we understand that the emphasis is on the names, that all the names that are used in the book of Exodus, as we know it, are, 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 are prophetic prefigurings of destiny and of future. And as we look at Exodus chapter 1 and verse 1, we're going to see that the context conveys the names of the firstborn son of Jacob, Reuben, and the youngest son of Jacob, Benjamin. Say it with me, the firstborn son and the youngest son. Hallelujah. When we look at the firstborn son and we look at the youngest son, we will see the prophetic prefiguring of the atonement anointing. In verse 1 of Exodus 1, the scripture says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, every man with his household with Jacob. Verse 2, the first name that is mentioned is Reuben. I want you to see the name Reuben. Reuben, of course, would be mentioned first because of genealogy. But the name Reuben shows us the prophetic prefigurings in the atonement anointing and how the book of Exodus is going to show for us the figure of the Lamb of God and the work of atonement. Hello, somebody. The Bible says in, in, in Exodus 1-2, Reuben, who is the firstborn of Jacob, means see a son. So the very first thing we're directed to when we look at the book of Exodus is the phrase, see a son. God wants you, as you read the book of Exodus, to see the son of God, to see a son who was crucified, to see a son who was offered on the Calvary's cross. Somebody ought to say, God, open my eyes that I might see a son. Somebody ought to praise him right now. See, a son means that throughout Exodus, there is going to be a manifestation of the revelation of Calvary and the bondage-breaking power in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So we see here the firstborn son, Reuben, which means see a son, and the youngest son, Benjamin. Hallelujah. Connects us to the context of Calvary. Touch your neighbor and say Calvary connection. Hallelujah. If we look at the scripture, we will see, continuing in the context, in the book of Exodus, the names are not reckoned by their position in pedigree or genealogy. They're, they're not completely put together, but we know that, that Benjamin was the youngest son of the 12 sons. Benjamin was born on the way to Ephrath near Bethlehem. His mother died in childbirth. He was the only son of Jacob that was actually born in the promised land. All the other sons of Jacob were born in Syria. And so we see here that Benjamin was born on the way to Ephrath, being the only son, being right near Bethlehem. And the scripture says in Genesis chapter 35, verse 16, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Verse 18 says, And it came to pass, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Ben-Yamin. Now, beloved, I'm going to show you how we see a son in the name Ben-Oni, and we see a son in the name Ben-Yamin. First of all, we need to understand that the name of Benjamin, who was born right outside of Ephrath, which is the city of Bethlehem, the village in Bethlehem that Jesus was born in thousands, uh, thousands of years later. We are going to see that the name Ben-Oni means son of my sorrow. But the moment Ben-Oni was named and, and Rachel named her son, son of my sorrow, immediately Jacob changed the name of that son to Ben-Yamin, which means son of my right hand. So we have son of my sorrow and son of my right hand. We are seeing a son, hallelujah, in the book of Exodus so that we might know that Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Somebody ought to say Yeshua is his name. Come on and give God the praise and give God the glory. So we see it all prophetically put together by the power of God that on the way to Bethlehem, right 
on the way to the promised land, outside of Bethlehem, outside the village of Ephrath, Benjamin was born. And Rachel, because she was such a woman, a Navia, she was such a prophetess that she names the son of my sorrow. And Jacob, being such a prophet, changes his name, no, not son of my sorrow, but son of my right hand, showing a prophetic prefiguring of the son of God and the son of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but a man who was risen to the right hand of the father. Somebody ought to give God the praise and give God the glory and say the Passover promises are mine tonight. I, I didn't hear you. So we understand the work of Calvary, and we see that Calvary was before the foundations of the world. Because as we look at the book of Exodus, and as we see a son, and as we see the prophetic prefiguring and traces and trails of the blood evidence of Jesus Christ and the Calvary connection, we will understand that Calvary was preordained before the foundation of the world. Somebody ought to say he already decided the destiny to go to the cross before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, the scripture, the text teaches, we have not been redeemed with corruptible things, but the Bible says in verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times just for you. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Somebody ought to say, this is God, hallelujah. Before the foundation of the world, it was already decided that this son would go to Calvary, hallelujah. So we see that every book of the Bible, we can find Calvary in every book of the Bible. Touch your neighbor and say, I can find Calvary in every book of the Bible. And so we see, hallelujah, the atonement anointing. And we see the atonement anointing prophetically prefigured for us, dear people of God, in the names of Reuben, see his son, and in the name of Benjamin, son of my sorrow, Ben Oni, and son of my right hand, Ben Yamin, born in Ephrath, right outside of Ephrath, on the way to Bethlehem, the prophetic prefiguring of the work of Calvary. Hallelujah. And we're going to see that because throughout the book of Exodus, we see the atonement anointing and the foreshadowing of Calvary's cross because we see the cross that is inscribed in the book of Exodus, we know that through Christ, We've already obtained the power of the Passover promises in our life. You have already become a participant through the blood of the Passover promises of power. That means he's going to break the bondage of your burden. He's going to break the burden of your Pharaoh off your life. That means, dear people of God, that he's going to give you the spoil for your toil. And you're going to be able, hallelujah, to take some riches out of this season in your life. Touch your neighbor and say, the season of sorrow is about to end. He's about to give me some divine compensation for all the devastation in my life. I'm going to take out with me when I get out of Egypt. I'm taking out with me jewels of silver and jewels of gold. And I'm going to put it on my sons and my daughters. Somebody ought to give God the praise. Say this with me. It's blood bought. God's already given his guarantee. I am a recipient of the Passover promises. I don't have to worry about it because it's already been bought by the blood. Hallelujah. And we understand, dear people of God, through the scripture, looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Part A of verse 11, but the key is going to be in verse 12. As we look at the text, we realize that God has done a great wonder with us through Christ because now we who are Gentiles, who do not have to observe as glorious as the Torah is and as much as we 
we study Torah and we love Torah and we devote our life to Torah study. But we are not bound to the observance of every commandment in the Torah in the sense that through Christ, hallelujah, when we follow him and we have been redeemed by his blood and we have the power of the spirit, the righteousness of the Torah is fulfilled in us who are in him. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say amen. And because of that now, we have a very special blessing that's been given to us through Christ that we are recipients of the promise without the curse. Do you know what that means? That means I have access to every promise in the Torah, but I don't have to worry about the curse. Somebody ought to say, I have access to the promise without the curse because of the blood. Somebody ought to give God the praise and give God the glory for the blood. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, part A and part and verse 12 of the verse says, Wherefore remember that you being in times past were Gentiles, past tense. So in the sight of God, you were considered Gentiles before Christ. And the only righteousness that God required of Gentiles was the seven Noahide laws. Verse 12 says, At that time when you were without Christ, being aliens, that word translated in the Hebrew mentality Aliens being strangers or being the foreigner or being the goy or being, or being a, uh, the, the Gentiles. We're without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the, co from the covenant of promise. Now watch this. He says, in times past, before you knew Christ, this is who you were. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. That means you were pure Gentile. And you were strangers, which is a, a synonymous word with Gentile. You were strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now you who were sometimes afar off, afar off meaning afar off from the promise, afar off from the covenant, afar off from Passover, afar off from Rosh Hashanah, afar off from Sukkot, afar off from all of the feast days and all of the promises that God gave to Israel. We had no access as a people. We had no inheritance as a people. But now because of Christ, we have access to all the promises that God gave to Israel. Somebody ought to say the promise without the curse. Give God the praise. But now in Christ you who are sometimes afar off are made nigh through the blood of Christ. So because of the blood you now have access to every promise without the curse. Touch your neighbor and say all the work is over. I have a real Shabbat. I don't have to worry about the work anymore because he did all the work for me. Somebody ought to praise God. Say, I'm entering into a supernatural Shabbat, not by my works, but by the grace of God. Somebody ought to give God the praise and give him the glory. Hallelujah. Now, beloved, we see the supernatural symbols of the blood throughout Exodus. And as we see the supernatural symbols of the blood throughout Exodus, we will understand the Passover promises of power that have been given to us. And we also understand that God has already given his guarantee for the Passover promises of power in your life. And the very first atonement anointing Passover promise of power that I want to share with you tonight is God's protection plan over your life. Put your hand up right now and say, because of the blood. God already has this protection plan over my life. That means God's already got your back before the attack. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't have to worry about it when I'm under attack because God's already got my back before the attack. It's an atonement anointing, a Passover promise, God's protection plan through the blood of Jesus. Watch this because we're going to see the supernatural symbol of atonement in Exodus chapter 1, verse 5. We've already seen the supernatural symbol of the Lamb of God and of the Son in Exodus 1, verses 1 through 3. Now we're looking at verse 5. 
And the scripture shows us the atonement, the atonement anointing and the Passover promise of power, God's protection plan. The Bible says in Exodus 1 verse 5, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. And Joseph was in Egypt already. Now, for those of us that are looking at this, what in the world do we, where do we see the blood of Jesus? And all the souls that went down to Egypt that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls. How in the world does that prophetically prefigure the work of the blood? But you and I will understand the number 70. 70 is a significant symbol. It is a significant symbol and a biblical, it is biblical and it is numerically equivalent to atonement. Say this with me. It is the biblical, numerical equivalent of atonement. So I don't want anybody to twist my words and say it's numerology, okay? Because we're not talking about the occult. We're not talking about witchcraft. We're not talking about psychic power. We are talking here about understanding the scripture, and we are understanding that there are certain symbols in the word of God that, especially in terms of numbers, that are significant symbols and that have a biblical numerical equivalent to represent a certain sign or a certain symbol that God wants to, to communicate to his people. So we see 70 as the significant symbol and biblical numerical equivalent of atonement. Say it with me, the biblical numerical equivalent of atonement. Amen. The numbers of 10 and 7 are atonement symbols. And so in Leviticus chapter 23, looking at verse 27, we will see that the numbers of 10 and 7 are atonement figures. Scripture said, and the text teaches, on the 10th day of this seventh month, you shall have a day of atonement. Now we understand that it is uh, the day of atonement is not only spoken of in Leviticus 23, but it is also in, in, ex, in Leviticus 16. We also see it again in Numbers chapter 29. We see it also in the book of Deuteronomy, and we see it throughout the scripture. So we understand that the numerical, biblical equivalent of atonement is 10 and 7. The symbol of 70 souls that went down to Egypt meant that there was already an atonement over their lives. Somebody ought to say, before I went down into Egypt, there was already an atonement over my life. Before I already got involved in this relationship, God already put an atonement over my life. Before my business collapsed, or before my child got sick, or before I got the news from the telephone, God had already put an atonement over my life. There is a covering atonement somebody ought to say hallelujah God has already determined my deliverance through the blood of Jesus and somebody ought to give God the praise so that means that the atonement for deliverance and the, the, the power of deliverance was already determined before the foundation of the world by the blood. This means that the blood is God's protection plan. Scripture was going out of its way to say 70 souls to let us know that even though Israel was going to go through years of tears, Israel was going to go through backbreaking bondage, there was already an atonement made. And that atonement was already made before the foundations of the world by the Lamb who was slain. Hallelujah. We already read it in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, that Christ, hallelujah, and his precious blood was already determined to go to Calvary before the foundation of the world. Somebody ought to give God praise. is God's protection plan over your life. This means because of the blood, he's already got your back before the attack. You need to tell your neighbor, he's already prepared a way for me. He's already got my back before the attack. So before you get the phone call, you already had God's protection plan in place. And before the devil ever tried to take you out, God already prepared his protection plan and had it in his place. Because we understand that those 70 souls are showing us that there was atonement made before they were ever in 
bondage before they ever went down to bondage. God already determined their deliverance before they entered into bondage. Somebody ought to say he's already determined my deliverance before I ever got in bondage. Before the enemy ever touched me, God already determined deliverance in my life. Somebody ought to praise God right now for the blood. The Bible says in verse 9, Then thou shalt cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound in the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement. And you shall make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Verse 10, And you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and its inhabitants. For it shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man to his possession. And you shall return every man to his family. That means possession, property, return, and recovery of every man to his house. Why? Because it was on the day of atonement. Why? Because the bondage breaking power of the blood causes what the enemy has stolen from your life to return back to you. Somebody ought to say, I'm receiving return and recovery through the blood. Somebody ought to give God the praise. The greatest supernatural symbol of the return and recovery through the blood is found in Exodus chapter 3, verses 20. 1 and 22 and Exodus chapter 11 verse 2 God made a supernatural sign as a promise before they left Israel before they left Egypt that everything that was taken was going to be returned. Even years of tears were going to be returned. The Bible says, I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the caterpillar has eaten. You didn't know this, but God is getting ready to return some things back into your life. He's getting ready to return, hallelujah, spiritual blessing. He's getting ready to return your sons and your daughters. He's getting ready to return finances. He's getting ready to return property. He's getting ready to return your dignity, your honor, your place, your position. This is all part of the Passover promises of God. Somebody ought to give God the praise. Hallelujah. In Exodus chapter 3, I'll read it quite quickly for you. The Bible says in verse 21, And I will give this people Hain favor. In the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass when you go out, you're not going to go out empty handed. That means you're not leaving here without pay because you went through some things. You went through some years of tears. You went through some humiliation. You went through some times of trial and trouble, and you went through dark days. And now before you leave, there needs to be some supernatural compensation for all the devastation of all those years of tears in Egypt. And God says, your deliverance is not gonna be complete, but the Passover promise of power is a little bit of spoil out of your toil. You need to know that God's getting ready to release it back into your life through the blood. Hallelujah, somebody ought to say it's through the blood. Now this is what is so awesome. Because the Bible says in verse 22, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. Well, first of all, it should be the proper way to state it should be jewels of gold and jewels of silver. But it begins jewels of silver, jewels of gold, because silver is a prophetic parallel always used with atonement. But now we need to understand these are not just jewels of silver, jewels of gold, but the word in Hebrew is a very distinct word which is used for the kalim, the, ka, uh, the kalim, which were used in the tabernacle were the vessels. The kalim, you're going to borrow of your neighbor kali. You're going to borrow of your neighbor utensils of silver and utensils of gold. But they weren't utensils. They weren't pots and pans that they were borrowing. They actually, and the word borrow is a, is a mistranslation. It should be demand of the children of Egypt demand from them the jewels of silver and the jewels of gold touch your neighbor and say i'm putting a demand on the enemy that he's going to have to release it back into my family he's going to have to release it back to my children he's going to have to release it back into my destiny demand of the enemy hallelujah 
a mistranslation in the English language from the Hebrew to borrow of your neighbor. Let him borrow of her neighbor jewels of silver and jewels of gold, but ask or demand. Demand of the enemy what he's stolen from you to give it back because before you get out of Egypt, before God lifts the level of your labor and takes you to the promised land, you need to know that there are some things that God wants to bless back into your life that the enemy has stolen. It is a supernatural sign of redemption and it has been given to you by the blood. Hallelujah. It is a blood-bought promise of Passover. Somebody ought to say the blood bought promises of Passover because Christ, my Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. I will give this people hain, favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass when you go out, you shall not go out empty. But every woman shall demand of her neighbor and her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, or kali of silver, and the kali of gold and raiment, and you shall put them upon your sons and your daughters. Why is this word translated jewels? Because it actually was jewels, but why in the original language does it say kali or together kalim? We need to understand that these actually jewels of silver and jewels of gold became the utensils that were used in the tabernacle. Because God says, I need something very valuable to build my tabernacle with that's going to bring the glory of God down. So we understand it was not just the monetary value that brought the glory over the tabernacle when those utensils were made by Moses and, and, and actually designed by Bezaliel and all of the utensils for sacrifice and worship were made and they were given to Moses on the mount according to the pattern that God showed him. They were not just given for the glory didn't just fall because of the economic value of those utensils. You and I need to know that those vessels that were used in sacrifice and worship came out of Egypt, but they were compensation for all the devastation. So they represent the toil. They represent the tears. They represent the labor. They represent all of the suffering in Egypt. And God says, this is what I'm going to do with your pain. It's now going to produce some profit. I'm going to take all the years of tears that you spent in Egypt, and I'm going to use it to build a destiny. I'm going to use it to build a tabernacle. I'm going to use it to build the kingdom of God. I'm going to use it to build my will. Somebody ought to say, I'm taking out of Egypt jewels of silver, jewels of gold that are utensils, that are tabernacle for tabernacle worship for the kingdom. Somebody ought to give God the praise. And so we see, hallelujah, that... The tent is a prophetic prefiguring of the bondage that broke because of the blood. Because this second atonement anointing is the promise of power in the blood of the bondage breaking power in the blood. Look, if you will, at Exodus chapter 7. And I want you to see verse 19. In a Hebrew sense of scripture, the first plague was blood and the tenth plague was blood prophetically prefiguring how the blood broke the bondage. Hallelujah. Chapter 7, verse 19 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to Aaron, Take thy rod and stretch thine hand over the waters of Egypt and upon the streams and the rivers and their ponds. Hallelujah. At that all their pools of water may become blood. And there was blood throughout the land. You and I need to understand that the scripture also tells us that the blood lasted seven days. So was seven days of blood. And this is also supernaturally significant because the word seven in the biblical, in the biblical context, in biblical Hebrew, the word seven is the word Sheba, which literally means oath. So that means God is making an oath by the blood. God is swearing by the blood. God is making a covenant by the blood. I can get a witness here anywhere. God is saying, I'm swearing by it. I'm making an oath. Of, it is a witness. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to give God praise. So we see the, the very first plague. Hallelujah. As a plague of blood and the water. Hallelujah. Churning to blood. 
But we also see it compared in context to John chapter 19, that the water that turned to blood is a prophetic prefiguring of the water and the blood that flowed out of the side of the Passover lamb. Somebody ought to say water and blood flowed out of his side. John 19, 35 says, but one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced his side and forthwith there came out blood and water. Somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. It's the blood that broke my bondage. The blood, hallelujah, is bring, becoming a plague against the wicked one. It's bringing down the powers of darkness. Somebody ought to praise God. And the third atonement anointing is the third atonement anointing promise of power is the blood is power against every plague in your life. In a Hebrew sense of scripture, the tenth, hallelujah, represents atonement, but it also, we need to understand that the tenth plague was a plague that broke the power of Egypt. And the tenth plague also represents the blood that breaks the power of the plague in your life. In a literal sense of scripture, the blood would have been, the blood in that 10th plague would have been and was taken from lambs that were separately consecrated for sacrifice on the 10th day of the first month. Again, we have atonement. That every Passover lamb represents atonement and represents the atonement anointing in the blood of the lamb. Hallelujah. So we see in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, the Bible says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take every man a lamb, a lamb for the house of their fathers. Now, in a literal sense of Scripture, we need to understand that these lambs were separated and consecrated to be offered to be sacrificed on the 14th day of the month, three days later. This was a lamb without blemish, a firstborn male of the flock. So even though the blood is going to be applied to the doorpost and they were going to eat the, the, the flesh of the lamb, we need to understand that this lamb represents a sacrifice because it is a firstborn. Hallelujah. God gives the specifics that it's as a sacrifice that's offered on the altar, though there's no altar being offered in this Passover because Christ is the Passover lamb offered on the eternal offer altar. Somebody ought to give God the praise. So there's no instruction to put this lamb on the altar. But the Bible says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you shall take it out from the sheep or the goats. Again, the scripture is being very articulate that it's a lamb among the sheep or the goats. I never heard of a goat being called a lamb. This is irregular wording in the scripture that is definitely a point, a pointing to atonement. Because on the day of atonement, one time a year when the high priest would enter in behind the veil and offer the blood on the altar for the sins of Israel on the 10th day of the seventh month, he would take the blood of a goat and he would take that blood of that goat and he would offer it for the sins of Israel to be forgiven. So now we understand here that the lamb should be without blemish in the first year, which represents a sacrificial lamb, an offering, hallelujah. But there's no altar. It doesn't tell us that anybody offered any lamb. We know who the lamb was that was offered. Somebody ought to say, he was the lamb who was offered for my Passover. Somebody ought to praise God. And you shall take it, your lamb, from the sheep or from the goats. So this means on the 14th day of the month, which is three days later. So we have the death and we have the resurrection. We have the offering and we have the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us, verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike the blood on the upper doorpost of the houses where you eat it. And the scripture goes on to say, hallelujah, in verse 12 or verse 13. And this blood shall be a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you 
and the plague will not be upon you to destroy you in the houses where you are when I smite the land of Egypt. Now this word, a uh, token, this blood shall be for you a token. This word token, we have, we've had many different multiple meanings for the word token in Hebrew. In Hebrew, oftentimes there is one word and it has multiple meanings. But one of the meanings in the Hebrew language that translates the word token, it translates into the word woot, we need to understand what it means. It means to point to the future or to point to a future event. This blood shall be the sign of a future event. I, I don't know if anybody heard me. The token means a future event in Hebrew. Something that's going to come to pass that didn't come to pass yet. So we need to understand that when God commanded that the children of Israel take the lambs in the backyard and, and sacrifice them and put the lamb on the doorpost and that the death angel would be repelled and repulsed through the blood. You and I need to understand that the, the, the blood shall be a token meaning a sign of a future event God already took them out of Egypt based on the future event of Calvary this blood shall be for you the sign of a future event the, the sign of of something that has not taken place yet. That's what it means in Hebrew, token. Something that hasn't taken place yet. For example, many of the prophets, the word token or sign, Ezekiel was told by God to be a sign in Ezekiel 4.3. That same word, wuth, is used here for a future event that he was to demonstrate to Israel through his life. And through the season that God told him to prepare demonstrations that something ahead was about to happen to Israel and he would be the sign of what was going to come to pass. Another use of that word, woot, as a sign of the future event was used by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 20 verse 3. That same word is used in application of Isaiah as a prophet who was asked by God to demonstrate his own life, the future events that were going to take place so that when everyone in Israel saw the dramatic demonstration of what Isaiah was doing, he was demonstrating as a sign the future event that would take place in Israel. Now I want you to know that application. God has said to his children, you're going to put the blood on the doorpost as a sign of a future event that's going to take place on a hill called Mount Calvary. Somebody ought to say amen. And the blood shall be a sign of a future event on the houses where you are. And based on the future event that is not yet, because he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, and the Almighty lives in that which was, and that which is, and that which is to come, because he doesn't live in our time zone. And, and you need to understand that God's word oftentimes is prophesied in the past, in the present, and in the future. I can't get a witness anywhere. Therefore, in heaven, when the Almighty said to Yeshua, his only begotten son, somebody ought to say amen. <laughs> Who will become the lamb? He already decided before the foundations of the world, he would become the lamb. But because of God's time zone, because he lives in the past, in the present, and in the future, there is no just stationary moment as we know it. It was as, he, as if he was already slain. It was as if he already went to Calvary. Somebody got to say, God's already given his guarantee. 